Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's COVID-19 media briefing. This is our 100th briefing since the pandemic began. It's a Q&A about vaccine, and it is being aired live on YouTube. Joining us today are DHS Deputy Secretary Julie Willems Van Dyke and Dr. Stephanie Schauer, Division of Public Health Immunization Program Manager and part of our COVID response team. And we will begin today's briefing with remarks from Deputy Secretary Julie Willems Van Dyke. Julie. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us. You know, throughout this pandemic, we have committed ourselves to transparency and to making sure the people of Wisconsin are well informed about the actions we can all take to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our state. Briefings have been a key way to keep you informed, and as Elizabeth just mentioned, today marks our 100th briefing since the COVID-19 pandemic began. You know, while I've had the honor of being one of the faces in front of the camera, these briefings would not happen without the committed work of dozens of people behind the camera. So on this day of our 100th briefing, I want to take a moment to thank the people who make this possible. I know I'm grateful for your work, and I also know the entire state is safer because of your commitment. As of today, we have administered 860,389 doses of COVID-19 vaccine in Wisconsin and 197,362 of those doses have been second doses, which means 197,362 Wisconsinites have completed their vaccine series. You can find these numbers on our vaccine data page. And as of today, you can also find much more detailed information about vaccine administration on our vaccine data dashboard. The new data display is part of our commitment to transparency in our COVID-19 response. The best way to understand the dashboard is to see it. So I'll take a moment to walk through it with you. On the left side of the dashboard, you'll see a map of Wisconsin, shaded by county based on the percent of residents who have received at least one dose of vaccine. This is called a heat map. Darker shades reflect higher percentages and lighter shades, lower percentages. To see the actual percentage and number of doses administered for any given county, simply hover over the county with your mouse and a box appears with the county's population, along with the number and percentage of first and second doses. There are also options to view this map shaded by percent of residents who have completed their vaccine series with the second dose or you can toggle to view these data settings by region instead of county. By click, clicking a county or region on the map, all the data on this dashboard will shift to show the vaccination specific to that area. Below the map, the bar graph shows a summary of vaccine doses administered by week. We have been vaccinated in Wisconsin for just under two months and as you can see, we have made progress every single week when it comes to the number of shots in arms. Above the weekly graph and to the right of the map, you can see a gauge coded in orange and gray, along with a percentage. The gauge represents the total population of Wisconsin, and the gray area represents Wisconsin residents under the age of 16 who cannot yet receive their vaccines because they are not authorized for this age group. The orange section represents the total portion of our population who could receive the vaccine when we have adequate supply. Because we are phasing in eligibility for vaccination, currently focused on frontline healthcare workers, residents of long-term care facilities, police, fire, and correctional staff, and people aged 65 or older, not everyone in the gray bar can currently receive a vaccine. We're certainly looking forward to the day when we have enough supply for everyone in that group to receive a vaccine. 
The percent you see here, 10.4%, is the percentage of all Wisconsin re residents who have received at least one dose of vaccine. Our goal is 80% coverage for all people who are authorized to receive the vaccine. Below the gauge, you will find percent of population breakdowns by demographic data, such as age, sex, race, and ethnicity. These percentages of, again reflect what we call coverage rates or the percentage of the total population who have received either their first or both doses, depending on your view. Because the Wisconsin Immunization Registry does not require reporting demographics, we are missing some data as noted in the, in the graphics. However, our rates of missing data ranging from less than 1% for sex to 8.8% for race are far lower than the national reports of missing data from CDC who cited approximately 50% of records missing race and ethnicity data. We are committed to equitable distribution of the vaccine and that means we wanna get as accurate a picture and to share that picture of who the vaccine is going to. It also means we are making intentional decisions to reduce systemic barriers and encourage vaccine uptake in our communities of color across Wisconsin. These intentional decisions include prioritizing vaccine orders for our tribal partners, community health centers, federally qualified health centers, and local health departments, providing services for socially vulnerable Wisconsinites. We are also directing $6 million in grant funds to support community-based organizations to do vaccine outreach and education. We also aim to close gaps in access to vaccine through programs like mobile vaccination teams, community-based clinics, and the federal retail pharmacy program. We have a lot of work to do in Wisconsin to achieve equitable vaccine distribution and uptake, and even more work to do to achieve equitable health outcomes beyond vaccination. It is work we are committed to doing, and this is a start. As we continue to vaccinate our eligible populations in Wisconsin, we also need to remember that COVID-19 is still present and spreading in our state. We are adding 1,239 new cases today, which brings our total confirmed cases of COVID-19 to 553,110 people. Our seven-day average of new cases is 879. Today, we are reporting 11 more Wisconsinites who have died from COVID-19, which brings our total deaths to 6,140 people. Our thoughts are with their families and friends who have lost loved ones to this virus, and it is up to each of us to take action to help prevent further loss. Thank you, and let me turn it back to Elizabeth uh, for your questions. Thank you, and we will now take your questions and a reminder to maintain audio quality. Please remain muted until it's time to ask your question. If you're on the phone and you're able to do so, use star six to mute and unmute. And we begin with Danny Maxwell at WKOW in Madison. Hi, um, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering if um, you guys could tell us a little bit more about um, just the federal uh, programs starting tomorrow at Walgreens in Wisconsin, uh, where, um, which ones that might be or which counties, if you have any kind of information about how that's gonna work uh, starting tomorrow. Sure, I'll give a little introduction and I'll turn to Dr. Schauer for more details. So this is a, a program, as you mentioned, it's a federal program. Uh, it is uh, starting this week across the country. Each state has uh, a pharmacy partner, as you mentioned, ours is Walgreens, who will be receiving, in our case, about 18,000 doses of vaccine that will be distributed across Walgreens, um, uh, across Wisconsin. 
And so let me turn to Dr. Schauer for more details about that distribution. Yeah, so about 178 Walgreens throughout Wisconsin uh, will be receiving this vaccine. Um, it is a high percentage of stores, but not every store. And so it's important for individuals to, to recognize that many stores will have the vaccine, but not all of them. And as uh, Deputy Secretary Williams Van Dyke said, that the um, number of doses is, while it's nearly 18,000 doses, it means that each store will only have a very limited number of doses. Nevertheless, it is a really a great opportunity that we have more doses coming into the state. This does not um, come out of the state allocation, so this is in addition to our state allocation. So we have additional doses um, and that this program will continue. As more vaccine becomes available at the federal level, it is the intention of CDC to go ahead and expand this program, both in terms of the number of doses that they could allocate to the states, as well as our ability to use additional uh, pharmacy partners. And I believe to register for the program, uh, at this point, people can go to walgreens.com and there's a, a, a splash page that in, uh, guides them through a registration process. I do know Walgreens is also planning to add uh, a phone line soon for those who would prefer to call in. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, let's go now to Katrina Nickel, Fox 11 in Green Bay, Katrina. Hi there. So my question is actually about the flu season that we've seen here in Wisconsin. In 2019 to 2020, there were over 36,000 cases of the flu during the regular flu season. This season, this year, that number recorded is around 38, if I have my numbers correctly. Can you kind of explain why this is? You know, is it the vaccines, the masks, people staying home, or a combination of everything? Just to elaborate on this a little, please. Thank you. Dr. Schauer, would you like to speak to that, please? Certainly. So you're right. I think all of these things that we've been putting in place of late really contribute to the reduction in the influenza um, circulation that we've seen. It's the physical distancing, it's the masking, better hand washing, and many children are not in schools and often that is a, a source of infection from school aged children back into the families and into the communities. Not the only one, but one that's important. And so we are seeing a reduction in the uh, flu activity. It, it does certainly, while that is good for folks in staying healthy, it does present some challenges with respect to strain selection. And as um, they move forward and need to determine what's been circulating and how to choose which vaccines to include or which viruses to be included in next year's vaccine, it does present um, a little bit of a challenge. Um, nevertheless, it is still important for folks to um, not let down their vigilance and make sure that they are protected against flu it's not too late to go ahead and get a flu vaccine um, this year. The other uh, vaccine that I would just add in as we're talking about prevention um, is that the pneumococcal vaccine. This is a vaccine that is recommended for individuals 65 and older and helps prevent some of the, um, the common uh, secondary infections after respiratory illnesses like flu. And so I would encourage that while folks are waiting and, uh, for their COVID-19 vaccine, that they check their immunization records and see if they are eligible or due for their um, pneumococcal vaccine. Once again, it's individuals 65 and older should receive one dose and certain individuals may require a second dose and they should check with their doctor. For that, uh, next question to Heather Poltrock, WSAW, Heather. Hi, Emily Davies in for Heather. Uh, my question, I know we've asked in uh, previous DHS calls, but as we are getting uh, closer to understanding how many vaccines pharmacies and vaccinators are gonna be getting, um, just wanted to ask again about the rural areas receiving vaccine. I just talked with a pharmacist who has been requesting for the last three weeks and hasn't received any vaccine at all in, in, in Portage County and looking at the map, Portage County um, hasn't, re hasn't had a lot of people vaccinated. Granted, they don't have as many healthcare workers as some of the other areas, mm -hmm. but um, just wanted to see what rural uh, vaccinators can expect. Yeah, I think as you look at the map, you'll see a mixture, right? You'll see um, some more rural areas of the state are doing very, very well. Other 
rural areas, um, not as high a vaccination rate. Um, and so a couple of things I would say about this. First of all, what I say about everything related to vaccine, we don't have enough vaccine. Um, and as I've said before, I can't wait for the day that every pharmacy, including that one in Portage County who requests vaccine is able to receive vaccine. Um, the second thing I would say about this is um, I just want uh, to um, review our allocation method. Up until three weeks ago, our allocation method was simply you asked for vaccine, you got vaccine. We had enough vaccine for that more limited population of healthcare workers and people in long-term care facilities that we could meet all of our vaccinators' um, requests. But when we started seeing much higher um, rates of requests and uh, out, far outstripping our supply, we also added in a population formula so that we would equitably distribute the vaccine across the state. And so um, that means that rural communities will get a proportionate number of vaccines as will urban communities. Um, the third thing I would say about this is it has been very challenging, especially for vaccinators, which many pharmacies are, that they're only requesting a very small amount of vaccine. And um, because of our distribution system, it is challenging for us to make deliveries of only 30, 40, 50 vaccines. So we've set a floor of at least 50 vaccines. I know some have asked for that and still not received them just because again of that, um, that challenging vaccination supply issue. So the map is really important to us. Um, our population um, factors should help with making sure we're getting uh, equitable vaccine to each county. And we're also working with counties to be sure that there are adequate vaccinators um, or systems for vaccine delivery. As we've mentioned uh, before, we have mobile vaccination teams out of the state, and so it can certainly also assist rural parts of the state who may not have as many vaccinators by requesting mobile vaccination teams that can come help bring vaccine and um, vaccinate rural residents. Thank you for that. Let's go now to Stephanie Hoff at WIS Politics. Stephanie. Good afternoon and thanks for taking my call today. Uh, so my question is again about that federal retail pharmacy program. It says that those 178 Walgreens locations are predominantly in underserved areas. I was wondering if you could explain what underserved areas are and where they are. Thank you. Sure. Um, Dr. Shower, would you like to talk about the social vulnerability index and the analysis that um, was done uh, to uh, support those statements? Sure. So the social vulnerability index is a way of measuring um, in a particular region um, where individuals may, um, where disparities exist. And so we've used that information and it exists at um, I believe at a, a zip code level that we can go ahead and map out areas of the state that have a higher vulnerability versus lower. And we did go ahead and map out and place the Walgreens sites over those areas. And that information helped inform which sites and will, will inform where sites are that are receiving that vaccine. Obviously, in getting towards those um, issues re regarding disparities, that we want to make sure that we have as many outlets and accessibility for areas that are experiencing significant challenges or communities where there are disparities. So we do have that information and I, I think we have the ability to go ahead and adjust as needed if we find that um, we need to, to move. As indicated, it's many of the Walgreens sites, but it's not all. And so we do have a bit of flexibility there. Thank you for that. We go now to Scott Bauer at the Associated Press. Hi, thanks again for doing this call. Um, looking back at the, at the uh, new website, it looks like for this week, um, the number of vaccines that have been administered is you know, 83,000 versus 215,000 last week. 
I wonder if someone could speak to um, why this week is so much lower and does the weather across the state, the cold weather, is that affecting vaccine distribution in any way? Thanks. Sure. Um, I'm happy to uh, speak to that, Scott. First of all, remember we're not through the week. Um, so the week runs from Monday through Sunday, I think, uh, is our cadence. And so, um, uh, and it would only represent vaccines through yesterday. So we still got half the week to go. I understand if you double it, it still would be lower than last week. Um, one of the reasons that I think um, we're seeing lower, a, a little bit lower numbers this week is because of that vac su vaccine supply issue. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we had a lot of new people come into the system. As many of you have pointed out, we did have some vaccine and inventory and uh, vaccinators across the state. And so many of our health systems who did have um, a few thousand extra doses waiting were able to get those in the arms of people over age 65. And they no longer have those dose act that it is the weekly allotment um, largely that is going into people's arms now rather than the weekly allotment plus a little bit of inventory that was in place. Um, I know that's true. I, I've talked to healthcare providers. They, they are very nervous about being down to their last few vaccines when they've got appointments made. Um, and that's true whether you're a big health system, a small pharmacy, a local health department, but that's what every one of our vaccinators is um, really dealing with. I think, again, because the supply is going to come up a little bit with the additional doses we've received with the federal government, plus the, um, uh, the doses that you'll see in, in Walgreens, hopefully we'll see it climbing a little bit. Um, but there's a number of different factors, largely driven by supply that are affecting this. Um, I really, I don't know if the weather is affecting people's uh, vaccine administration. Most of vaccine administration is done inside, not in drive-through clinics, although we do have some drive-through clinics in the state. So it may not have the same effect as you might see at some of our drive-through testing sites. Um, the staff doing this work are primarily indoors, so I'm not sure whether it would have as great an effect as you might see it happen, have on some of our um, mobile drive-up testing sites. Thank you for that. The next question Denise at Racine Question. County High. We're Denise. becoming uh, about four or five prisons and a jail. We have a substantial number of in uh, transmission of COVID-19 is definitely high in congregate settings and um, has been seen to be particularly high often in correctional settings where um, uh, people are often crowded together, little, um, there's limited opportunity to social distance. Uh, uh, um, and so the, those things can complicate uh, and increase spread of um, the virus and that is scheduled to begin March 1st. Um, congregate settings, uh, in addition to the ones we've already done in long-term care, are part of that phase. And that is the rationale for including congregate settings in phase 1B is that the people who live in congregate settings are more susceptible to exposure and spread of the virus because 
the nature of correctional facility and scheduled to begin uh, March 1st. Thank you for that. The next question now to Wisconsin State Journal, David Wahlberg, Wisconsin. Yes, thank you. Um, what can you tell us about the much that might contribute to the racial disparities we're seeing in the initial administration of vaccines? Yeah, thank you, David. I think you've noted uh, a key factor as we look at um, uh, the different age, sex, race, and ethnicity breakdowns that we've had that they are largely related to the groups that have already received vaccine. Um, of course, that first group being healthcare providers, then police, fire, and correctional personnel, and now people over the age of 65. Um, we do not have specific racial breakdown of, of each of those groups, I think, at least not that I can report to you at this point in time. Um, I do know healthcare workers tend to be predominantly Caucasian um, and, and it is contributing to um, the fact that we're seeing more white people vaccinated than uh, black people or Hispanic people or other uh, racial groups. And I think it leads to a question, which is what can we do to better diversify our healthcare workforce or our police workforce or our fire workforce? You know, what are the barriers to people of color for becoming healthcare workers? That is um, part of when we talk about structural racism, thinking about what are the barriers that make it harder for someone uh, who grows up in a black neighborhood in Milwaukee to become a nurse or to become a pharmacist or to become a doctor. Um, and as a state, we can all work better together to address those, those structural barriers like access to good education, mentors, um, supportive environments, <clears throat> to, um, to be able to see that kind of opportunity, um, just right down to transportation to school and good nutrition um, to be able to learn well and all of the things that contribute to what makes it more likely for one person to be able to follow that educational pathway into a healthcare profession and might limit somebody else. Thank you. The next question to WMTV in Madison, Nikki at WMTV. Hi, thank you very much. For, thank you very much for doing this. My question is now that we're seeing more uh, people that have gotten the second dose, um, what kind of reactions are you guys seeing? Are you seeing more of a reaction with the second dose or not? Dr. Schauer, would you like to take that question, please? Sure. So, um, you know, it, some people are certainly reporting um, second reactions um, that are a little bit more robust after the second dose. Um, we do anticipate that after, you know, vaccination, whether it's the first or second dose, that people may uh, have some local reactions. They may have redness or swelling at the site of injection or not feel well. Um, you know, the next day or two after. If you look at um, the MMWR, which was published recently, um, it talked about people feeling, you know, perhaps having a headache, fatigue, um, sort of very transient. And that's a good sign. It really shows that the body is responding and building that immunity. Um, um, so that is an anticipated portion of it. I do say, uh, it was reported in that uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report about adverse events that what they are seeing and were reporting was consistent what they were seeing um, in the preclinical trials. So no big surprises and what you might expect for vaccines in terms of having some of those, those secondary, um, you know, not feeling great in the, in the following day, but they are self-limiting and resolving. Thank you for that. Uh, next question to Sean Kirkby at Wisconsin Health News, Sean Kirkby. Um, hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, can you provide an update on the efforts to vaccinate long-term care facilities and whether more doses have been sent or redirected towards that effort? Um, are we still playing aside doses for that program or have we been enough? Thank you. Yeah, um, 
Dr. Shah, I don't know if you have the latest data on how many um, we have vaccinated. I know we are well into um, vaccinating the second doses in the skilled nursing facilities and um, making our way through the first doses in assisted living facilities. Um, what I can tell you is we have um, last week we deferred transfer of any further doses. Once we've gotten through the first round in the assisted living facilities, we'll have a pretty good sense of the total number of doses that Walgreens and CVS will need for that program. And we'll be able to make final decisions next week about the need for transfer of further doses. But Dr. Schauer, what can you tell us about uptake in the, in the program? Sure. So um, for the skilled nursing facilities, so folks remember this is the, the first part, about 349 facilities. We're 63% of the way through them having their second clinics, so providing that second dose. For the assisted living, um, we're about 47% of the way through um, uh, those uh, entities having their first dose clinics. So um, the assisted living is a much larger group that's um, nearly over 3,000 facilities and they continue to make good progress um, with having administered up to over 36,000 doses in the assisted living thus far. I think it's a um, one of the interesting things and in, in, important to note is that in the um, skilled nursing facilities where they're doing these second dose clinics, that about a quarter of the doses that are administered to staff are for individuals who are receiving vaccine for the first time. So it's important uh, to, to note that they are continuing and as fo if folks uh, had opted out at that first time or if the facility decided to do it in waves that we are seeing uptake of first dose at those second dose clinics, which is, which is good news. Some of the folks who may have sort of had that wait and see approach are now stepping up. And fortunately, the pharmacies will be going back a third time to ensure that those individuals finish the series. Thank you. Uh, next question now to Madeline Anderson, WITI in Milwaukee. Hi, just following up on the conversation about DHS trying to prioritize access to the vaccine for those underserved communities. I talked with a pharmacist in Milwaukee's inner city who says she's been denied vaccine for the past two weeks. And she says, you know, the majority of her patients are from communities of color. And I understand part of the reason, you know, she was denied vaccine is because she would have received less than 50. But my question is, doesn't it seem counterproductive to not allocate vaccine to vaccinators that are serving the very groups that DHS is trying to prioritize? And do you think you might rethink how you're allocating vaccine moving forward since a big focus is on racial equity? Thank you. It's a great question. And, you know, as we have moved along um, in our process of uh, designing this vaccination system uh, very quickly and designing an allocation process we have constantly evaluated and adapted as we've moved along. And so, yes, our team is definitely looking at our allocation strategy um, and um, thinking about ways to uh, better ascertain who people are serving. That is why we have um, prioritized federally qualified health centers and free clinics and tribal clinics and local health departments because we know those are all providers who have baked in um, to their mission service um, to populations that typically have barriers to um, receiving care and other systems. But we are also hearing from vaccinators who, like this pharmacy, are saying, you know, I also serve a, a, a largely minority population in the inner city. And so um, we are interested in uh, how we can get vaccine to them. We did fill a few requests this week of people who made that known to us. And we are looking at ways we can systematize that further in the future. Um, so that we're sure we're getting vaccine to those communities um, that are not um, getting it through other mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, next question to Rose Schmidt, CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, 
I guess my question is, can you tell us when the Walgreens is in Wisconsin, will actually have the doses in hand ready to um, get shots into arms? And are you expecting this to help, um, you know, get through the eligible groups faster um, in terms of, you know, the, the people we currently have eligible for the vaccine? Are you hoping that this partnership with Walgreens will get through all those populations a lot faster and speed up that timeline? Thanks so much. Well, I'll turn to Dr. Schauer for um, the timeline, but what I can tell you about the number of doses is 18,000 doses a week is another 18,000 towards our target. Um, however, <laughs> we have, um, you know, if you take the population of 65 and older, you know, we have noted that's over 700,000 people. Um, we've vaccinated, uh, 300 and some thousand. So we maybe are getting um, part of the way there now, um, but we still have a long way to go. So the point is we still have hundreds of thousands of people to vaccinate and 18,000 a week is, is going to get us there sooner, but I don't think I can quite classify it as fast yet. So um, I continue to say this is Every step forward is important, just like the 20% of additional doses the state has to allocate, which is also about 18,000 more than we had a few weeks ago. So step by step, we will get there, um, but these are not huge increases in, in dose compared to the need, um, but they are good increases. What we really need are more vaccines. Um, and that will come through better manufacturing and also as new vaccines are brought into the mix. And as we've said earlier, uh, Johnson & Johnson has submitted their, um, uh, uh, their application to the Federal uh, Drug Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, um, and that will be considered later this month. So we're looking forward to having a third vaccine in the mix in March. But Dr. Schauer, um, what can you tell us about when Walgreens will actually have the vaccine and begin vaccinating? Yes, so they are receiving the vaccine directly from um, the federal government and they opened up their registration tool this past Tuesday and it's my understanding is that they will begin vaccinating tomorrow. Um, as mentioned earlier, the number of doses per store is approximately 100 doses. So it is a very small amount and it, people do need to have an appointment um, scheduled to go ahead and receive vaccine and they can access that through the Walgreens uh, website. So um, it isn't a, a period where people can just show up. They do need to go ahead and uh, book an appointment. And so we do anticipate that this will continue. We don't know the number of doses that we will receive or that they will receive in subsequent weeks, um, but uh, it, it is, a, it is a, a, a step forward and it offers another avenue for individuals who are currently eligible in Wisconsin to receive vaccine. Thank you for that. Uh, Adam Duxter, News 3 in Madison. Adam. Hey guys, you hear me all right? We can. All right, sorry about that. Thanks for taking our call. I'm working on a story based out of Janesville where Mercy Health says they were supposed to receive a shipment of 2,000 vaccines this week and instead have received zero. And obviously we've covered in the last couple of weeks, Mercy Health using vaccines for um, groups that were not yet cleared. Can you speak at all to, to this specific situation? They said they've had to cancel a bunch of appointments because they haven't gotten the 2,000 vaccines they, they should gotten and still haven't gotten them. I don't know about the specific situation with Mercy Health, but what I would say in general about vaccination is that here's the process and how it goes. And that is that each week vaccinators submit a request for how many vaccines they want. We run our allocation formula against those requests and decisions are made about who will receive how much vaccine. If Mercy Health actually was told by us they're receiving 2,000 vaccines and they didn't get them, I hope they've contacted our staff. But if it's a situation where they just assumed they would get whatever they got last week, we have to caution our vaccinators to be sure they're not making those assumptions. As I said, we're getting allocations from the federal government one week at a time. And we're running um, the survey and the formula request uh, we have been one week at a time. The good news is with a two to three week window, 
that we've received from the federal government. This week, we were able to ask our vaccinators about their needs for the next two weeks, and we'll be able to let them know how much they're going to receive next week and the week after, which I know will be helpful to them. Uh, and as long as we continue to get that longer guarantee of allocations from the federal government, we intend to run these um, multi-week uh, schedules so that our vaccinators can know going further out how many vaccines they will receive and make their appointments accordingly. Um, I, I know it's been challenging for a number of health systems to have made assumptions about how many vaccines they'll receive and make appointments that they've had to cancel. Um, but um, this is part of the function of living in a world of scarce resources. And we really appreciate the patience that both our healthcare providers and our patients have as we move through this one step at a time. Thank you for that. Uh, next question to Bridget Bowden, Wisconsin Public Radio. Bridget. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question about the new dashboard. I'm wondering if um, the plan is to update these new numbers every day, and also if the um, number on the dashboard of residents who have received at least one dose, if that reflects the number of vaccines given through the previous day. So it will be updated every day. We freeze the data at a certain time. Um, maybe Dr. Schauer knows that exact time, but we freeze the data at a certain time and that reflects all of the data that has come into the Wisconsin Immunization Registry as of that time. I believe it's around midnight and then we report it the next morning. Um, and those are vaccines based on date reported um, that go into that daily update. And then they get sorted out because our vaccinators are asked to report within 24 hours. We give them a 72 hour um, grace window. Um, many of the vaccines come in through electronic health record data transfers into our system. Um, and um, and we do know occasionally people are behind and vaccines are coming in for even a few days before that. So it's both a combination of what gets reported every day. And then, for example, in the um, vaccines per week, they get sorted into the buckets there based on what week those vaccines were given. So you'll see a little bit of shifting of the data, but it will be um, updated every day. Dr. Schauer, anything? you would add in addition to that? Yeah, I think just to note that the Wisconsin Immunization Registry is a very dynamic um, mm -hmm. tool and that it has data flowing into it at all hours of the day. So depending on the day and the time that information is pulled, it, it can, it does and, and change. And so um, what you see reported to um, the CDC as well as what's reported on our website, there will be some small differences um, just to, to keep in mind and that we do uh, look to keeping this as up to date and encourage you to use the DHS website for the most up to date Wisconsin information. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question to Jody Felenius, WTMJ in Milwaukee. Jody in Milwaukee. Hi. Um, I was just wondering have we passed any milestones when it comes to distributing the vaccine to eligible groups? Like, what percentage of phase 1A and 1B? Have received their shots or like have all the healthcare workers received their shots? Thanks. Yeah, that's a really hard thing for us to track because we don't have a database of all healthcare workers or all police personnel. Um, so those occupational groups are, are challenging for us to track. The one that's easiest for us to track, however, are people age 65 plus. And so um, if you look at the site today, you will see that it indicates to us that 34.1% or over one in three um, people 65 plus have received their first dose of the vaccine. And um, so that's great progress. We're about a, a third of the way towards 100% of that population having their first vaccine. Thank you for that. Uh, now to Adam Rogan, the Journal Times, Adam. 
Hi, thanks for taking the call as always. Um, Wisconsin's more rural counties have had the highest rates of vaccination, like in Iron, and also the lowest rates of vaccination, like uh, Rusk and in Taylor, with the more urban counties, like we've seen or Kenosha or Milwaukee being more towards the middle, but Dane is an outlier with a higher percentage of vaccination. Um, can you explain why these trends exist more so that like the rural counties are the highest rates and lowest rates? Yeah, I can give you some insights. There's no, again, um, uh, we don't have full visibility on all of the many factors that affect that. But uh, we were sitting with a group of local health officers looking at the map yesterday. And one of the things that they noted um, is that in many of the rural counties, that you see higher rates, they are places with local hospitals. And many of our rural counties do not have a hospital or some don't even have a health, may not even have uh, many healthcare clinics uh, or don't have pharmacies. And so um, a big part of some of the shifts I think you see right now are largely related to where healthcare uh, workers uh, work and live um, and that is accounting for much of the, of the um, differences you see in rural counties. Part of it is also remember in the first five to six weeks of vaccine or vaccine distribution, we just gave vaccine to whoever asked for it. And so we have some rural communities that had a lot of vaccinators. Um, they registered early, they all asked for vaccine and they were really rigorous about getting vaccine out. When we said age 65 uh, plus could go, they, they had vaccine and they were ready to roll. And um, you know, one of the good things about a rural county is if, if you've got 20,000 people in your county and you vaccinate 2,000 people really quickly, all of a sudden you're at 10%. If you're in a county of 100,000 and you vaccinate two 2,000 people really quickly, you're only at 2%. And so, um, again, some of our rural places were really ready to roll when we expanded 65 plus and were able to get vaccines in arms um, very quickly. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question goes to Maddie Heim at the Appleton Post Crescent. Maddie. Hi, thanks for doing this call. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, given what we've seen with the racial disparities and then what we could see as uh, vaccinations open to broader groups, are there specific steps or actions that um, DHS will be taking to try to reduce those racial disparities? I'm just wondering about, I think you've talked about mobile uh, clinics before. I know other states have been doing kind of like big public information campaigns, things like that. I'm just wondering if there's specifics you might be able to share about reducing those disparities. Yeah, thank you for that question, Maddie. I really see this coming for vaccine along three lines. One is making sure we get vaccine in the hands of people who are trusted healthcare providers um, for uh, people of color. Um, and so as we mentioned, our first step in doing that has been getting vaccine to tribal clinics. Um, and you'll note we are um, have less of a disparity with our Native American population to federally qualified health centers, free and um, uh, uh, community health clinics and local um, health departments. So um, as we talked about earlier, there are probably other providers we should be looking at. So first of all is allocation to people who provide services there. The second thing is very much what you have mentioned is about public awareness and, and outreach to populations. And we also know People like to receive information from trusted messengers, from people from their own community. And so that is why um, through DHS and, and the new immunization money that has come to us from the CDC, we are allocating uh, nearly $6 million in grants that will go out to community-based organizations within communities and neighborhoods to do outreach and messaging and um, uh, talking neighbor to neighbor about um, these vaccines, um, how they're safe, how they will help protect you, where you can get them, helping connect people who aren't sure where they can get a vaccine with getting a vaccine. So that's the second arm is outreach and uh, awareness building education. And then the third arm is making sure we have a vaccine delivery system that's ready and um, 
able to provide vaccines once we've allocated them. So not every community has a federally qualified health center um, at, or a tribal clinic. Um, everybody has a local health department, which is a good thing. And so it's also thinking about, as you also mentioned, how do we mobilize um, other support for vaccination to enhance the healthcare system and those other systems in communities that may not have as much vaccinating access. Um, I'll, I'll add that uh, you've probably heard the federal government is also looking at allocating vaccine to our federally qualified health centers. Um, we're excited about that. It will take a little um, lo bit longer than immediately because they're going to start in a couple of pilot places and then slowly expand. Um, that will be good. And also uh, FEMA has been talking about citing larger throughput clinics um, that would be available to everybody uh, in states. And we've been having conversations with FEMA about that and, um, and thinking about places in our state that would um, definitely um, serve the needs of, uh, of diverse populations um, as we think about citing those clinics. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question to Kelsey Dickinson, NBC 26 in Green Bay. Kelsey in Green Bay. And a reminder, star six will mute and unmute your phone. Kelsey, NBC 26. Hi. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So we've seen some with some other mass vaccine rollouts, like with polio, for example, that it can take years or sometimes decades from the start of distribution before a virus is uh, fully under control. And of course, many of those vaccines are still administered worldwide today. So talking a little bit along those lines, what do you think we'll see with the COVID-19 vaccine down the road? Yeah, I would say, I mean, there are very few viruses that we have actually eliminated. Um, vaccine is one tool in the toolbox to control vaccine spread. Um, and so I think that is very much what we are striving to do here. Um, uh, it is also why we need to have really high vaccine coverage, often referred to as herd immunity, in order to really tamp down the spread of COVID-19 because as long as the vaccine is circulating at very high rates, it will even spread amongst vaccinated populations. Um, these are incredibly good vaccines. They're 95% effective, but if, if, if vaccine, or excuse me, if virus is very prevalent, it will still get to the people who are, who are, are in the 5% that didn't get protected. Um, and certainly if we don't have high coverage to those who haven't um, been vaccinated at all. So in using a vaccine strategy to address a virus, it is both a combination of a good vaccine, it is a combination of high vaccine coverage so that we achieve herd immunity. And it is also about continuing to study if the virus is changing or mutating and if we need additional boosters um, or repeat vaccines to keep the virus at bay. Let me turn to Dr. Schauer and see what other thoughts as our immunization expert she would add to that as well. Yeah, you know, as you were talking, it, it sort of brought to mind measles. The measles vaccine is very effective. It's 95 to 98% effective. Um, but we know that, you know, during measles outbreaks that um, it can circulate and find those individuals who are not protected. And so um, while we, it's important to have a very high threshold of folks in the community who are protected because that um, virus in particular is so infectious. It's similar as that getting the, the burden down is important and maintaining that immunity within the community is going to be important. And I think it, uh, it remains to be seen about these variants and, and whether we will need boosters to go ahead and ensure that we have good protection against infection as well as severe disease. Thank you. Uh, next question to Mary Spacuza, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Mary. Sure. 
Thanks for taking my question. Um, I know you talked about this already, but I just wanted to follow up. It does look like Milwaukee County is significantly behind Dane and a number of other counties. I think it's like 64th. And I know you talked about some of the reasons um, why rural counties might be ahead, but what is being done um, to improve health equity and um, try to help Milwaukee with uh, vaccinations, but Milwaukee and other counties that are behind? Yeah. Well, certainly one of the things, Mary, that I want to come back to that I mentioned before that I think is really critical here is the change we put in place three weeks ago um, around looking at population factors as we look at vaccine distribution. So um, we want to make sure that uh, large urban counties like Milwaukee are getting their fair share of vaccine. I think part of what we are seeing uh, in this map is, you know, as I mentioned, um, that we might see disproportionate rates of um, administration based on where the healthcare settings are in the state. And I think that is definitely contributing. Um, but I also think it's because up until three weeks ago, we did not have a population formula and that will start to help equalize that allotment of vaccine. I think the other thing is we think about the healthcare systems um, that explains this. I, it's not getting to your question about what are we doing, but explains it is Milwaukee is geographically a much smaller county. And so I think a lot of the people who work in healthcare systems in Milwaukee may very well live in one of the counties surrounding Milwaukee um, as much as you know, certainly some of the employees live in Milwaukee County, but they might live in Waukesha County or Ozaki or Washington or Racine. Um, and, you know, when you look at Dane County, it's much bigger geographically, may have a higher percentage of the healthcare workers who work in Dane County who actually live in Dane County. And so that allocation formula is certainly one of the things that we are doing. Another thing we're doing is making sure we're counting the allocation of vaccine accurately. And what we realize is there are a number of big health systems that are headquartered in Milwaukee. And we may have been counting vaccine that were going to those systems that was then being dis redistributed to counties outside of Milwaukee. So that is a change that we are currently implementing to make sure that we're only counting the vaccine towards the population formula for the vaccine that's actually staying in the county. So, um, and, and that not only affects Milwaukee County, but other places like Wood County where the hub of Marshfield is there, um, but vaccine may be going to other places and not for the residents of that county. So those are a couple of things. And then the third thing is really, it's talking, it's working with key Milwaukee partners, with Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee Health Department, with uh, community-based organizations, with our FQHCs to say, you know, how do we uh, make sure we're getting vaccine in the arms of people who we're not right now and, um, and not making assumptions about that. Um, you know, as I heard Dr. Izzard say, don't assume we're vaccine hesitant until you've given us the vaccine to actually give to people. And so we need to take action to make sure that there is adequate vaccine supplies to um, the neighborhoods and to the uh, healthcare partners. And then there is good outreach and information to connect people um, with those vaccinators to make sure we can uh, close these inequities that we're seeing. I know Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee did a vaccine town hall last night. I hear it was excellent, great information to provide to people. And I think that's just one example of the kinds of uh, education outreach that needs to be done over and over again uh, in community centers, in churches, in neighbor to neighbor, through schools um, and through a whole wide variety of ways to help people know the vaccine is here and how they can get it. And then finally, it's also about having more vaccine, right? This would be a lot easier if everybody could get vaccine. And um, unfortunately, as we've spoken before, some of the populations who have been eligible for vaccine are not as racially and ethnically diverse as our general population is. And so getting more vaccine so it is available to all all people um, is also just one of the simple things that is going to help close this gap as well.
Thank you for that. Uh, let's go now to Terry Sater, WISN, Milwaukee. Terry. Yes, good afternoon. Um, you said earlier that each Walgreens would receive about 100 doses. Should Walgreens stores in inner city and higher minority areas get a larger allotment of vaccine than, say, a suburban Walgreens store? Well, that is a great question, and I think right now the allocation of that vaccine is in the hands of the federal government. Is it not, Dr. Schauer? Correct. So um, it is something uh, I meet regularly with um, our nation's state health officers, and it is a question that has been raised about how we might be those of us on the ground in our states who know those neighborhoods and communities working with our local health departments and, and partners um, might be able to provide further insight to the national chains about the distribution across the state. For that. Uh, now to Taryn Powell, uh, WUWM Milwaukee. Taryn. Taryn Powell. All right, let's move on to Megan Kernan from WBAY in Green Bay. Megan. A reminder, star six will mute and unmute your phone. Megan, are you on the call? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. My question is regarding the federal retail pharmacy program. Will there be a list released of the 178 Walgreens locations? And will other pharmacies like CVS be able to partner in the program in the next phases to come? Or is each state only allowed one pharmacy partner? Dr. Schauer, would you like to talk to those questions? Yeah, so uh, with on, within the Walgreens website, it's my understanding that you can choose the location. It is many of the Walgreens locations, but not all. Um, this is a, a, the, a federal program and they are starting it out slowly because the number of doses is relatively limited, so to speak, that um, is allocated towards this program. But we do anticipate that um, as the federal allocation grows that they have indicated that we would be able to add in additional um, pharmacy partners and other chains um, and would certainly look at the distribution of those sites and, and figure out which is the can help fill in the gaps that are existing. So we do anticipate that this program will grow per the federal government, both in terms of um, the number of sites and uh, the pharmacy partners, as well as hopefully the number of doses per week. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And with that, we are wrapping up today's briefing. Uh, but before we go, as we've told you, today marks our 100th briefing since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And briefings are one of the best ways we can make sure everyone in Wisconsin is well informed about the realities of COVID-19 and the ways we can protect ourselves and our communities. And of course, it takes a team of people to make these briefings possible. So as we mark 100, we want to acknowledge their hard work, and say thank you.